yeah, let's go ahead and talk about class lambda piecewise functions. Um, basically, they're just, I mean, they are like their name says, they are different pieces of functions graphed on the same coordinate system. So let's start with an example. And I'll probably, I'll probably write things up here. I'll probably also show you, um, show you on, not on, not on, geez, no. not on Desmos like I might often do, but just show you the pictures I've already drawn on the class notes, which you, should, which you can also of course access yourself. So let us begin. So let's consider the following piece by function. That's weird. My computer sometimes just blinks on and off for a second. I really, really do not have any inkling as to why. Oh well, not your problem. So also please stop me if you have questions, concerns, comments, you know, all this. So let's look at this piece by function. F of x when is equal to x squared plus one when x is less than two. Sometimes people put a comma here. I like to write a comma there. Sometimes people don't. And the other piece of the function is seven minus x when x is greater than or equal to two. So let's start off by just graphing each of the functions on their own. So I'm going to graph all of x squared plus one and all of seven minus x. And I'm going to use some of the tools we talked we talked about in the last couple of classes about transformations, you know, shifting, stretching, compressing. Specifically for x squared plus one, which I'm going to do in green to match the notes I've drawn there. Right, y equals x squared plus one is the regular y equals x squared parent function, usual upward of the parabola, shifted up one because we've added one on the outside. So we plot a couple points to make my graph look nice. I'm going to do it in green though, not in black. So this is going to look like the following parabola. Is it actually touched the point right there? There's a y intercept of 0, 1. Ah, I didn't draw that well. I didn't write that well at all. And what I'm also going to do, because I know what's going to happen actually, is so I know I'm only going to want this portion of the graph when x is less than 2. So I'm going to plot the point when x is equal to 2, which is the point 2 comma 4. And it's right about there. Because typically when we graph these piecewise functions, we usually like to plot the points where one piece ends and the other piece starts. Let's graph the other one as well. y equals a 7 minus x. So if I'm graphing y equals a 7 minus x in the red, um, really it's just a line, so I just graph it like a line. Uh, I should also write things down here, right? This is y equals x squared plus 1. This is going to be y equals 7 minus x. And I would probably just plot this by finding the intercepts. I know if x is 0, y is going to be 7. I know if y is 0, x is going to be 7. So my intercepts are just 7 and 7, which I'm going to draw it first and map this. So 7 here, 7 there. I was going to do it in red, though. If you wanted to think about the transformations that you would do, um, I would rewrite it. I would rewrite it as y equal to negative 7, sorry, negative x plus 7. So you can see that you're doing a, really this negative could be considered inside or outside the functions of the pair function is y equals x. So you're taking your regular y equals x, doing a flip over, and then you're shifting it up seven. So that's how we're getting to here, in case you're curious. All right, so then I'm also gonna look at what's happening at x equal to two. So over here, one, two, and my graph isn't really well to scale, but it's okay. Right there's the point, two comma five. All right, so now here's what I, so essentially the idea is we're gonna put it all together. So from this graph, y equals x squared plus one, I want everything where x is less than two. So when I say, when I read this as x is less than two, I think x is left of two. So I want everything to the left of two here. So I want everything in that direction. You can also do the thing, and I, I mean, literally I need to say this to myself, right? the alligator eats the bigger one. 
So what's bigger? Oh, two is bigger. So X is, has to be smaller than two. Here, the alligator eats the bigger one. Oh, X is bigger. So X has to be bigger than two. So X is to the right of two. So here's two again, and this time we're to the right. And then I just look up or down from those arrows to see which pieces of the graph I want. So for the graph y equals x or plus one, I want everything to the left of that point. And I actually don't want to include that point. I should actually kind of think of it for a second as having like an open circle there. And I'm gonna want all of this. And so on. And then for the red graph, I want x to be bigger than or equal to two. So I want all of this. Usually I just kind of scribble. It's a little easier to scribble it. So I want the scribble parts on one graph. Okay. So putting it all together on one graph. So I have, here's my y equals x squared plus one. And right, that's the point two comma four right there. And then the y plus seven minus x starts the point two comma five. So there's gonna be a little bit of a jump. Right, two, three, four, five. It's gonna start right there. It's gonna go down to the right. It's gonna be the point seven zero right there. Point zero one. And so that's how we, so I will say, that's kind of the long way of graphing a piecewise function. Wow, I made a dumb mistake. And it's okay if you guys didn't catch me, but I definitely made a mistake. And here's the mistake I made. Let's go back for a second. So I found the point two comma four, because I was kind of thinking of the not shifted parabola, y equals x squared. Um, but really, if I plug in two for x here, so this is what, so when you're, when you're finding what's happening at the place where you change from one to the other, you should actually plug in the number, x equals two, x equals two. Plug in two here, do you get four? Well, I mean, yes, but you get four plus one. So that point should actually be point two comma five. So I've graphed this wrong. That point isn't correct. It should actually be, meeting up right there. So it would be open there, but then I would fill it in and it would look like that. And this is the function x squared plus one when x is less than two and seven minus x when x is greater than or equal to two. So questions about this. There's a couple of things I want to say, but I want to see if there's any questions first. Um, let me point out one thing here. So let me go back. So this is not the point two comma four, right? This is the point two comma five. And I just, it kind of, this is why it's sometimes it is important to have the right scale, right? It kind of, yeah, yeah, it's not wonderful. Uh, but what I want to say here is that you can certainly do this every time. You can graph both or all if there's more than two pieces and then kind of pick the parts you want from each one. The problem with this is it's time consuming, right? I don't really want to graph two or three or four whole complete graphs and then pick the pieces I want because it just takes a while. So um, let's look at another example and kind of talk about how we would do it. Oh, back. So I, yeah, I'm getting ahead of myself. So let's do a slightly different. So let's do the example. Actually, I kind of was accidentally almost doing before. I'm going to change up a little bit. So there are some good examples of notes, but I feel like you can look at those on your own. I'm gonna do some slightly different examples just because I think it's worth our while. So let's graph y equal to x squared minus one 
when x is less than less than or equal to two. Let's still take with two. And let's do y equal to um, six minus two x. Sure. When x is greater than two. And so I'm going to kind of do this one in reverse. I mean, I'm going to give you the final result first, and then we're going to back and see how we could have gotten there. So y equals x squared minus one. I know that looks like our regular parabola shifted down the line. So I'm going to start drawing it. We shift this down one. And I know that two is kind of the place where I switch from this one to this one. So left of two, right, when x is less than or equal to two, I'm going to have the graph x squared minus one. The parabola, it opens upwards. I know the vertex is at zero, negative one. I've also got the point one, zero, and I have the point two, three. Because if I plug in two here, I can actually plug in two. Two squared is four, four minus one is three. And then you also get the point negative one, zero. So when I'm thinking about graphing this parabola, I'm thinking, okay, well, I want this parabola but I'm stopping when x is less than or equal to 2, right? Here's 2. I want the parabola just to the left of 2, not to the right of it. And on the other side, I want the line 6 minus 2x. Now I know that 6 minus 2x would have a y-intercept of 2. It would have an x-intercept of 3. So it would be kind of like all of this here, but I only want to start when x is bigger than 2. So if I plug in x equal to 2, if x could equal 2, y would equal 6 minus 2 times 2 to 6 minus 4, which is 2. So I would almost get the point 2 comma 2. This would be an open circle because I can't actually plug in 2 because x is bigger than 2, not bigger than or equal to 2. And then I would go to the right. Now I can see that this has an x intercept of 3. So if I set y equal to 0, 6 minus 2 times x equal to 0. That would mean 6 equal to 2x. That would mean x is equal to 3. So I'm going to get the point right there. It's going to look like that. And if I kept going up this way, I'd hit the y intercept of 6. But I don't. So that's what the piecewise function looks like. And again, the way we're kind of getting that is we're thinking, oh yeah, this part here, that's just the entire graph. If the entire parabola of y equals x squared minus 1, but I'm stopping right here. And this one here, y equals 6 minus 2x, is this graph here. But I'm not starting until I get to, you know, to 2, which is like right there. So again, I don't want to have to graph these each time, but we certainly can if we need to. Let's look at some more examples. So that's really the whole idea, is that we're taking different pieces of functions we have a graph and putting them all on one graph. Let's do the following. Let's look at f of x equal to, sure. Um, two to the x plus one when x is less than zero. And then 3 minus x when x is greater than or equal to 0, less than or equal to 2. And five minus x squared when x is greater than 2. All right, this is what we're graphing. And we know what each of these graphs look, looks like. In fact, I, so I'm going to do it kind of the, the first way we did. Right? I'm going to graph each one in a simple loop. So 2 to the x plus 1 is our usual exponential shape, but it shifted 1 to the left. So we're adding 1 inside the function. So 2 to the x plus 1 looks like usually you get the point 0, 1. We're shifting that left by 1, so we're getting the point negative 1, 1. And if you plug in 0 for x here, you get the point 0, comma 2. So it's looking like this. 
but we only want when x is less than zero, so we only want everything to the left of zero, right? Because this line here, right? Over here is x less than zero. Over here is x bigger than zero. And then three minus x is again just a straight line. Three minus x looks like this, where the y-intercept is three and the x-intercept is three. Okay, so I only want that when x is between zero and two. So I'm starting at x equals zero. And here's x equals two. So I just want this portion right here, stopping right there at the point, well, if x is two, three minus two is one. And then for the third piece, it's the graph of five minus x squared. So that's your, you can think of it as negative x squared plus five. You're flipping it over, right? It's a vertical flip across the x-axis for vertical reflection. And then we're adding five, so we're shifting it up five. So normally it open upwards, but then it's opening downwards and it ends up five. So it's gonna look like this. And there are two things I should look for. I should look at what's happening at two. So when x, if x could be two, negative two squared, oh, that's a good question. I want you guys to help me out here. Is negative two squared negative four or positive four? You can type it in the chat. It is definitely negative four. Thanks, Sophia. And the way we know it's negative four is, I'm really kind of the PEMDAS rules, right? Parentheses, exponents, multiply, divide, add, subtract. You've got an exponent here, that's what you do first. Oh, two squared is four, and then the subtract or the negative sign comes after, so it's negative four. So negative four plus five is one. So over here at two, we're getting a y value of one. And so we're actually just gonna get this part of the graph here, right? Everything to the right of that point. And then we should also see what the y, or sorry, the x-intercept is. Um, the x-intercept there is not a nice integer number, but if I set x squared minus five, sorry, five minus x squared equal to zero to find the x-intercept, I can add x squared to both sides. And then the square, and then solving that x is gonna be plus or minus the square root of five. This one here is when x is negative root five. This one over here is when x is positive root five. And you should, if you're finding intercepts like this, leave it as root five, not whatever it's approximately equal to. It's like 2.2 something or 2.3 something. Um, great, so now we're gonna throw it all on one coordinate system. So this piece and this piece and this piece, and I should be a little bit more specific here. For the two dx plus one, where x is less than zero, I can't include this point right here, which is zero comma two, right? X can't actually be allowed to be zero, so we're gonna have to make that an open point there so that we don't include it. In a similar way, this point over here, when x is bigger than two, we're not supposed to really include this point either. So we just want everything to the right of that point, but not including that point. So if it's a strictly greater than or a strictly less than, you get open points. If it's a greater than or equal to or less than or equal to, that's when you get to fill in the point because you're including that point because x is equal to that value. And of course, I don't have enough room to put this all on this side, so I'm gonna flip it over and graph all these things. So let's, look, let's see, we've got, um, Sorry, I made stuff up. So I've got that, that, and that. Okay, so so I know for the two to the x plus one part, I've got I've got it at the point zero two, so I don't actually have that point, and then it's going down to the left, um, and to the left here, I know I have the point negative one one. And then I have a what over to the left. I have a 
horizontal asymptote of y equals zero. Because all exponential functions have a horizontal asymptote. And if you don't shift it up or down, then it's y equals zero. Okay. And then to the right of zero, we have this segment here. The line that goes, the line segment that goes from zero, three to two, one. So zero, three filled in to two, one. And then that one starts at two, one. Oh, so that's actually going to work out. That's going to connect up. So if you have a filled in point here and the same not filled in point here, it ends up getting filled in, right? Because you'd say, oh, it's not filled in, but then that's going to fill it in. So from here, we're doing the rest of this parabola that would have been like this, right? Like, like this part right here, sorry. A little messy because of this. Sorry, I need to draw now my marker. And I should actually draw this dash part up here. So that's the point two, one. And there's my x intercept if you really want it, which is the point square root of five comma zero. So there's this piecewise function. Kind of weird looking. I will point out, just because it is something that we're going to talk about in 16 or 17 or 21a, that this function has a discontinuity, right? From here up to the point 0, 2, it is continuous. But then once you get to the point where x is 0, it jumps up here to 0, 3, which is a jump discontinuity. Not that we, we don't talk really a lot about continuity in this class. But visually, it's something I think we all kind of have an idea of grasping that, oh, if something's continuous, you should be able to draw it without like jumping from one point to another or lifting your pen off the paper, is what people often say when they talk about continuity. Let's do one or two examples, well, more examples. Oh, there's actually a very important example I should talk about next, um, which I feel like I've definitely alluded to in this class already, if not outright said. But I'm going to say it again, even if I've said it before. This function is super important. Well, let's look at the very well-known piecewise function, y equal to the absolute value of x, which you know what? I'm sure all of you could draw. How do you find the vertical and horizontal offset? So the vertical asymptotes, there aren't any here. Um, and again, this was the piecewise function 2 to the x plus 1 when x is less than 0, uh, 3 minus x when x was between 0 and 2, and 5 minus x squared when x is greater than 2. So the way I found the horizontal asymptote was by recognizing, oh, that's an exponential function. And we know that for exponential functions, like y equal to b to the x, or a to the x, or 3 to the x, or 5 to the x, or any positive base to the x power, always has a horizontal asymptote at y equal to 0. And it's always to the left, as long as your base is larger than 1. The only time this changes is if you have a vertical shift up or down. This 2 to the x plus 1 doesn't have a vertical shift, it has a horizontal shift. So the horizontal shift left 1 doesn't change the fact that our horizontal asymptote is still y equal to 0. So that's how we kind of know, because it's one of the features that a exponential function always has. And that's true. I'm going to say that again. Exponential functions, whether they're 2 to the x plus 1, or 3 to the x, or 5 to the x, or e to the x, all of these have horizontal asymptotes to the left at y equals zero. Hopefully that clarifies your question, Jonathan. Vertical asymptotes aren't in, so, and I should say, there is not a vertical asymptote on this one. Um, I know this line kind of looks vertical-ish. It is not vertical. It's just getting very negative very fast. We will do one with a vertical asymptote after this one though. So let's look at y equals the absolute value of x. And I do want to tell you, this is a piecewise function. 
It's a piecewise function. I think everyone should really know how to write a piecewise function. So if someone says absolute value of x, we should really think, oh, well, the absolute value takes whatever I give you and gives you back the corresponding positive thing. So if I give you six, you say, oh, the absolute value of six is six. You give me back six. If I give you negative six, you say, oh, the absolute value of negative six is six. So I gave you a negative thing and give me back the corresponding positive thing. Here's how that works. If x is already positive, then the absolute value of a positive number is just that same positive number. So if x is positive, the absolute value of x is equal to x. On the other hand, if x is negative, like negative 5 or negative 6, then the absolute value of negative 6 is positive 6. And the way you take that negative number and make it positive is by negating it. Right? If x is negative 6, right? x is less than 0. If x is negative 6, then the absolute value of negative 6 is negative negative 6, which is positive 6. So it works. And then as an aside, which I'm sure I've also mentioned, another way to write the absolute value function is as the square root of x squared. That is the same thing. If x is positive, then the square root of x squared is just x, right? Like, for example, the square root of 5 squared is the square root of 25, which is 5. Just like the absolute value of 5 is 5. The square root of negative 5 squared is equal to the square root of, well, negative 5 squared is 25. Square root of 25 is 5. And just like the absolute value, right? The absolute value of negative 5 is 5. The square root of negative 5 squared is 5. So I really, really want to stress that this function and this function are literally the same function. The only other thing I should do is I should put the equal sign on these. It doesn't matter where you put the equal sign because they're going to match up. So I'll put it here. So now we're going to graph it. And we've already graphed this one before. But I want to graph it again just so you guys can see it. So it's going to be y equal to x when x is positive. OK, well, that's easy enough. There's y equals x when x is greater than or equal to 0. And then over on the left side, it's going to be y equals negative x, which looks like this. when x is less than zero. So you can really see, oh yeah, that's why the absolute value function looks the way it looks, because that's the way it's defined. But it really, really is a piecewise function. So when you in your future classes see an absolute value of a thing, you really should think to yourself, oh, hey, they're showing me a piecewise function. I could totally break this up into at least two different pieces. Um, in fact, let me show you another example of this. And then I promise we'll go over with the vertical asymptote. So something that I think is important to be able to do in your future classes is to take the absolute value function that someone has given you and rewrite it as a piecewise function. So let's say, for example, I want to graph the piecewise function y equal to the absolute value of x minus 3. And we could probably all graph it without really thinking about it. So usual parent function absolute value of x shifted 3 to the which way? Is it right or is it left? Remember, horizontal is kind of counterintuitive. Let me ask you guys, who votes right, who votes left? Yeah, definitely. Definitely right. And the way we know it's right is because x has to be 3 bigger than it was before. Right? Before, when x was 0, y was 0. Now, x has to be 3 bigger. x has to be 3 so that y is 3 minus 3 absolute value is 0. So you could, yes, you could totally graph this one without really thinking about what the piecewise pieces were. It's just going to be 3 to the right, usual shape. 
tech. But I really think it's worthwhile to be developing about what's really happening here. So just like before, it's always the same thing. If the insides are positive, then you just get what's inside it. So if x minus three is positive, then you just get x minus three. Seems reasonable, right? If x minus, so I will point out x minus three being positive is the same as saying x is bigger than three. So if x is bigger than three, like five, then five minus three is two and the absolute value of two is still two. So when you plug in five, and there's five, you get out two. But more generally, when you plug in something where x is bigger than three, you get out just x minus three. So if you plug in five, you get five minus three. If you plug in seven, you get seven minus three. On the other side, over here, when the insides are negative, so when x minus three is less than zero, or if you prefer, when x is less than three, right? Same thing. Well, over there, then you have to take what's inside and take the negative of it, right? If x was say one, one minus three is negative two. Then I want it to be positive two. So I'm gonna make it a negative of negative two. So on the left-hand side, it's negative x minus three. Because now if I plug in one, one minus three is negative two and negative negative two is positive two. And there's the point one, two. So that's how these absolute values work. You say, oh, if the insides are positive, you just get the insides. If the insides are negative, you get the opposite or the negative of the insides to make it positive. And that's all there really is. And then since these always typically meet up at the bottom here, you can put the equal sign here or here. It doesn't really matter. Okay. I just lost the cap of my pen. Where'd it go? It can't have gone far. There's not a lot of space in here. There it is. All right, let's do one with an absolute value. Sorry, not an absolute value. But we just did. Let's do one with a vertical asymptote. Take the one from my notes and change it up a little bit. Maybe this time I can fit everything on one thing. Let's, let's see. Let's see how good I can do this. Um, let's see. Where is my example here? So let's graph this one. Let's graph y equal to the piecewise function x minus two x plus two squared when x is less than or equal to zero, y equal to the natural log of x, when x is greater than zero and less than or equal to, hmm, I think that's gonna be fine, fine, we'll go two. And let's go x minus four when x is bigger than two. All right. I'm gonna graph all these things. I'm gonna try and draw the big graph here. Really, I just wanna draw the big graph. But so here's what I know. I know that x plus two squared is a parabola, but it's shifted two to the left. I tried to fool you guys. I was going right to the left. Okay. We know it's left because it's a plus inside, right? So x is to be too small. So x minus two squared, not too hard to graph. Sorry, x plus two squared, I said minus. I know it's going to shift my vertex, which would normally be at zero, zero, over to negative two. And then I'm going to stop at zero. So I know when I plug in zero, zero plus two is two, two squared is four. And I do have to get, right, it, it doesn't stop going to the left, right? I get everything to the left. So there's my the piece of my function from left to zero. And then from zero to two, I get the natural log of x. So this is the this is what I actually am going to graph off to the side. So the natural log of x or the log base anything of x, as long as that base is 
a nice regular positive number, usually an integer except for when the base is e. That looks like this. And that point is one, zero, and it keeps going to the right. So I'm going to stop that at two, right there, whatever that point is. I don't know what that is. Well, that's not true. I do know what it is. I know if x is two, then that's going to be the point two comma natural log of two. Natural log of two is about, actually, I don't know. I think it's about 0.7 or 0.69 to my calculator. Not because I'm going to graph it exactly. I just want to know so I can graph it kind of precisely. Yeah, that's all I would do with 0.69. So I know that I'm going to get the point one zero. And I'm going to get it. It's going to end at two comma natural log of two, which is going to be like, I don't know, maybe there. It's going to look like this. Vertical asymptote. Because the logarithmic function always is a vertical asymptote at x equals zero if it hasn't been shifted left or right. Okay. And we should label, we should really label all of the endpoints, right? That's zero, four. By endpoints, are in the places where you end one function and start another function. So you have zero, four. I should also label this x intercept. There's an x intercept. This point here is two natural log of two. And you should write two natural log of two, not two comma 0.69, because it's exactly natural log of two, it's approximately 0.69. And then finally, x minus four. So x minus four is just a line, right? Y equals x minus four looks like a regular line, but shifted down four, a regular y equals x line shifted down four. So it looks something like that. It's got an x and a y intercept of negative four, and x intercept of positive four. So, I know I would do this, right? I don't really want to draw the whole thing, but I'm going to. It looks like that, but I'm only starting at two. And I'm starting when x is bigger than not equal to two. So if x was equal to two, two minus four is negative two. So this would be the point two, negative two. I don't get this y intercept over here. I get everything that's to the right of this point. So I get all of this. You do get the point four comma zero. And that's what this piecewise function would look like. I've got x plus two squared when x is less than or equal to zero. And then when x is bigger than zero, but less than two or less than or equal to two, I get the part of the logarithmic function. And then when x is greater than two, I get the line x minus four. And I would say that this function is defined everywhere except at zero because, oh, that's not true. It is defined at zero. So in fact, I should point out because this is something that does come up on occasion. Most of the time we talk about how a function isn't defined on this vertical asymptote. But piecewise functions are kind of exceptions because I totally have a vertical asymptote right here, but I also have the function defined at x equals zero. That can totally happen on a piecewise function. It's okay, it's nothing to worry about. I just want to say like, oh yeah, that can happen. <laughs>